Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Froggart, and I'm a Senior Research Fellow at Chatham House. I'd like to welcome you uh, to this session, What Does Success Look Like in a Super Year for the Climate? Um, before in, uh, inviting our speakers to take the floor, I'll just make a, a few introductory remarks. Uh, firstly, just to say that this event is taking place on the record, and it is being recorded. Uh, and so for that reason, um, we won't be reading out names or asking you to join uh, the discussion uh, with videos because that uh, raises questions in, in terms of uh, uh, privacy. Um, and so therefore, please do put your comments in the Q&A throughout the discussions um, so that I can then pull upon these and, and put these to the panelists. Uh, this is one event uh, of 12 that is run by Chatham House uh, during London Climate Action Week. And we are very grateful to the organizers for this as an opportunity to, to discuss these key issues with uh, uh, members of the public and key actors from not just London, but from all over the world. Um, 2020 was supposed to be the super year for the environment, but in some ways like the Euros, it's been delayed. Um, and in this case, I, I think it has been delayed in somewhat to an advantage in terms of climate change. Uh, because if it had taken place in 2020, we would still be having President Trump uh, overseeing some of these discussions rather than Biden. So we can see that there is a new opportunities uh, for us as, as we approach COP26 and some of the other key ev events on environment uh, taking place in the second half of this year. Now, the topic is, is, is clearly quite a difficult one. What does success look like? And we probably won't reach an, an overall conclusion. However, what we are hoping to discuss will be the key issues for COP26 and some of the other summits. What are the opportunities and barriers for further ambition? And which are the countries and groupings that will significantly influence this outcome? Um, and it would also be interesting for us to hear from you in terms of how you judge success. What do you think of these key issues? So we are really hoping to make this as interactive as possible. So as I said at the beginning, please do put your comments uh, and questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And we will refer to these uh, in, in the second half of this uh, session. Just for those that don't know, um, Chatham House is a foreign affairs think tank. We are based in London uh, and I, I work in the Energy Environment Resources Department, uh, which engages in research uh, convening and policy uh, interactions across a whole range of sustainability issues. And consequently, we have a, a permanent research staff and many associate fellows who work with us on a part-time basis, but also work in other institutions. And therefore, the program has quite a, a broad range of experiences and networks. And this is why I'm delighted today that we have a, 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 an amazing representation of, of these researchers and associate fellows um, to, to, yeah, to share their, their thoughts and wisdom with you. So I'll just introduce them uh, from the outset, uh, but then you will, you'll see their full bios uh, in the chat shortly. So firstly, I'll be asking uh, Dr. Sam Gill uh, to take the floor. He's an associate fellow here with us at Chatham House, but he's also executive director of China Dialogue and associated with the University of Sussex. His research focuses on climate policy and politics, energy transition and energy governance in China, as well as Chinese investment in the Belt and Road. And so has a, a really incredible depth of knowledge that he will share with us today. Um, Anna Aberg is a research analyst at Chatham House, where she's working on international climate politics, UN climate negotiation, climate finance and climate risk. Prior to joining Chatham House, she was a desk officer at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, working on global and ocean issues, humanitarian policy, and Sweden's relationship with the World Bank. And finally, we have Bahana Yamin, um, who is an internationally recognized environmental lawyer, uh, climate change and development policy expert. Um, she was voted number two uh, in the BBC's BBC Power List, uh, where the judges described her as a powerhouse of climate climate justice and is active in numerous community-based social initiatives in Cameroon. Two other things really worth highlighting in terms of Fahana is a long-standing experience in working with the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And uh, I, I really don't think it's uh, modest to say 
on her behalf, but I think she was widely credited in getting the goal of net zero emissions by mid-century into the Paris Agreement, which is really a tremendous achievement. So we are, really have, as I said, an amazing set of speakers with a great broad uh, set of experiences. Um, so Sam, maybe I can turn to you first. Um, through your sort of Chatham House hat, uh, you published a, a paper on uh, the questions about yeah this year, the super year and its potential for 2021. This was published in March. Maybe you could sort of talk through what you thought in turn at the time with the main outputs, but also what do you think may have changed in the following sort of four or five months? Thanks, Anthony. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, so, I mean, the paper set out really um, in, uh, initial kind of theory of why the super year is important. And that comes down to, you know, quite a simple idea that global problems, whether we're talking about ocean conservation or climate change, tax havens or debt relief, require global solutions. And that the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated very vividly how international cooperation, action and, and ambition can be obstructed by competition, by suspicion, by protectionism, and how costly the results of those failures can be. I think that's evident in COVID-19 that, you know, when inter individual nations hoard crucial vaccines, as is, you know, a, um, a real problem today, or fail to share public health information internationally, global efforts to exit the pandemic, or at least to better manage its consequences are being harmed. And just as achieving coordination and leadership is necessary for that exit strategy for the pandemic and for, for an economic recovery from, from COVID-19, it's needed too for climate change and for all of the sustainable development goals. And of course, this is taking place in a context where the world order is ever more fragmented, where tensions are, are rising geopolitically. Um, I would say thanks to a sort of a longer term shift in the uh, balance of economic power from west to east and, and an increasingly multipolar um, system that is sort of challenging the post-war international rules and institutions. The pandemic, of course, isn't the cause of that, but has acted as an accelerant. Um, and, and that is, you know, uh, we see that through rising US-China tensions to rising attacks on the multilateral system. We see it in the sort of reshaping of global supply chains. Um, in, in all of these cases, I think we can see where COVID-19 is something of a crisis or a turning point for, for globalization. And also how it shows us something about the nature of these sort of fragmented systems across, uh, across the globe where stresses and shocks can risk these kind of cascading negative effects or vicious circles. Um, the pandemic of course has sort of many vivid examples of this, but climate change presents similar risks a drought in one, uh, in, in one geography might lead to an economic effect in another, um, which might spiral into, into social um, or political uh, effect in, in another geography. The theory of the, the, the super year that's sort of put forward in the paper is that actually there is an alternative to this, which is the generation of a virtuous circle rather than a vicious circle. In other words, just as failure to act within one system can obstruct action within others, positive interplays can be created by coordinating multiple levers for change between systems. So where an action towards a policy goal actually strengthens the likely achievement of other goals rather than creating trade-offs. So that's the promise of a super year. And the idea of course was that you could realize a kind of green recovery in 2021 by um, achieving a, a coordination between multilateral organizations, national governments, regional organizations to exercise greater leadership pursue a shared vision for global coordination, um, what, what we call in the paper an arc of engagement. And I would see those sort of primarily across, for example, the three Rio conventions, all of which have their, their uh, summits this year, the CBD uh, COP15 taking place in, uh, in, in Kunming uh, in, the, um, in the autumn uh, for the Convention on Biological Diversity, UNFCCC COP26, of course, the UN uh, Food Summit, as well as the um, uh, 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 biodiversity um, desertification convention. Um, and you can find even within these sort of overarching themes, such as uh, the circular economy or nature-based solutions as models that could offer that kind of um, uh, suggestion of a more synergetic virtuous circle type approach. We also see the rollout of China's 14th five-year plan this year, uh, the European Green Deal, the G7, the G20, um, President Biden's Climate Leaders Summit. So the, the 
the concept of the super year there wasn't really to find a single solution and wasn't suggest that there are there are sort of silver bullets as much as there is this need for uh, for, for, for a multilateral approach and for kind of iterative approaches across the multilateral uh, systems that are responsive to feedback that make these links and that bind together and kind of intensify the coordination that's needed. In terms of the state of play, you know, on the positive side, we have seen a lot of momentum around the net zero pledges, for example. Sort of for me, that some of the momentum, I guess, starts with the UNGA in, in, in 2060, um, where the um, uh, where President Xi's announcement of a of a net zero goal did, uh, you know, I think was a really significant moment um, because it was on a multilateral stage, but actually also because it was a unilateral announcement, one that's very tied to his political legacy, one that we're seeing sort of fleshed out um, in policy making, and one that I think is a significant market signal. We also saw um, a net zero commitment from from the United States for mid century. Um, we've seen rising ambition in some of the NDCs that have already been, been pledged, including from the UK, which is important as, as the COP26 host. Um, and we saw some momentum coming from the Climate Leaders Summit, um, South Korea's uh, pledge to end coal finance being you know, a particular high point. In the run up to that summit, we also did see cooperation sort of rising up between US and China. Um, uh, John Kerry, the, the US climate envoy and his Chinese counterpart made a joint statement. There was also an EU-China statement on, on the Kigali Amendment to the, to the Montreal Protocol. But it's, we're, there's a really long way to go. And there's a lot of, of unfortunately, kind of very um, uh, you know, open questions about whether this potential can be achieved. There's a lot I could point to, I guess, three that, are, that are, I'll use in my remaining time just to, to, to get across three points that I think we'll probably come back to. Um, one is, is that we're really a long way from 1.5 degrees on the, um, on the climate targets, and it's very unclear how we're supposed to, to sort of close that gap uh, without much higher ambition coming from, uh, from, uh, from the COP26 host and in general from the, uh, the, the kind of um, momentum so far under the UNFCCC. Um, uh, the, uh, the second I might note is, is actually the big question around how we get a better deal for nature. Um, clearly, one of the, the, the big kind of um, promises of the uh, super year agenda was to try and make this link around nature based solutions between uh, climate and biodiversity um, to, to, to uh, make progress on things like reforming subsidies so that, uh, so that they, they don't contribute to further deforestation and, uh, and biodiversity loss. But so far, the, the kind of um, momentum around the, the CBD process is very lacking. Um, there's a lot of blame to, to go around on all sides and COVID hasn't helped, but clearly neither the, the UNF, uh, the, the CBD uh, executive and, and secretariat nor the, the hosts, uh, China, seem to be putting uh, sort of adequate um, um, force behind this to, to um, produce the kind of momentum that will be needed for a, for a new uh, global deal for nature in Kunming. Uh, and finally, there's the big question about the way that um, the, the kind of solidarity that needs to be extended to the world's poorest and most vulnerable countries um, uh, is, is addressed. And, and you know, that's, it's a much bigger question we can get into. It's, it's not only about uh, climate finance, for example, but it's also about vaccines. But evidently, the world's poorest, most climate vulnerable countries are facing a really dire situation. The, the demand shock caused by lockdowns in rich countries has affected uh, developing countries very significantly. Many of them are very reliant on commodity exports. Um, this has led, of course, to an economic crisis and a debt crisis in many countries that's much worse than, than, the, uh, than the health crisis in the first place. Um, and without an adequate um, sort of uh, uh, offer from rich countries on this, at the very least addressing the, the 100 billion uh, uh, per year um, uh, target announced in, in 2015, as well as the other you know, major concerns of the, of the climate vulnerable countries like uh, loss and damage and adaptation. I really um, uh, feel that, that um, we're, we're missing out on an opportunity to, to see progress on the super year. So I'll leave it there and, and look forward to the discussion. Great, Sam, thanks very much indeed. Uh, it's always really handy as a chair when someone summarizes their key points at the end. Um, so, yeah, the 1.5 degrees, uh, the better deal for nature and the solidarity, uh, uh, yeah, in, in terms of poverty are key things that we will come back to uh, during the discussion. But maybe I can hand over to Anna. Uh, as I mentioned, Anna is a, a research associate at Chatham House. She's been running a, a, a briefing series for the diplomatic community over the last year. Um, so please do um, look at that on the Chatham House website. There's some amazing podcasts. Uh, but 
yeah, I mean, um, maybe on the basis of that, maybe you could give us some of your key insights into to what you think a successful COP might look like. How might that be achieved? And in some ways, what are the challenges and opportunities that um, we still face? Thanks, Anthony. Happy to. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here today, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So at and ahead of COP26, we really need to make progress in a few different areas. The first is on mitigation. Uh, the Paris Agreement is designed to increase ambition over time. And one key goal for Glasgow, or benchmark for success, if you wish, is that all countries submit new or updated NDCs, and that these are uh, much more um, ambitious than the last round, so that we get on track for a 1.5 degree pathway. Where do we stand on this? Well, some progress has been made. I mean, quite a lot of parties have, have submitted new or updated NDCs now, and some of these have been relatively ambitious. But as Sam said, we're really still far away from where we need to be. So we really need governments to ramp up their action in the last few months. Uh, we are still uh, awaiting a few NDCs from a few large emitters, but closing this gap won't be easy. But COP26 is not just about mitigation. It's also about being more ambitious on finance, on adaptation, on loss and damage. And it's about finalizing the so-called Paris rule book, which is like an implementation guide for the Paris Agreement. So in terms of finance, uh, the key thing here is really that developed countries need to uh, honor a pledge they made back in 2009. So, you know, ages ago of mobilizing 100 billion US dollars per year for climate action in developing countries. So far, uh, developed countries have not been able to demonstrate that this goal has been met or how they will achieve it over the coming years, because it's not just about mobilizing this one year, it needs to be delivered every single year up to 2025. There was, of course, a lot of hope that G7 leaders um, would provide greater clarity on this when they met in Cornwall a few weeks ago. Uh, and, you know, some commitments were made, uh, but it was not enough. And um, I think most would agree that uh, the G7 underdelivered on this front. And this is not okay. I mean, climate vulnerable countries, they need the money. Uh, they need a lot more than 100 billion for climate and climate finance. And it's also very much an issue of trust, which is critical in the UN climate negotiations. I think, um, yeah, so there needs to be clarity on the 100 billion ahead of COP26 and the sooner the better. Uh, and I also think there needs to be a special push to ramp up finance, both for adaptation and for loss and damage. And uh, we also need to facilitate access to finance. As Anthony mentioned, I ran something called the Diplomatic uh, Briefing Series, and we had the honor of hosting the ambassador of the Maldives uh, a few months ago. And what she said was that it feels like you need a PhD in climate finance in order to get hold of any funds. And I think this sentiment seems to be echoed in many countries across the world. Uh, I think it's also good to mention that the deliberations on a new finance goal uh, are due to start at COP26 for the period after 2025. And it's important that these discussions get off on a good start. Um, other important issues related to uh, adaptation and loss and damage include making progress on uh, kind of developing guidelines or metrics for assessing the global goal on, Paris, um, on adaptation in the Paris Agreement and fully operationalizing the Santiago network on loss and damage. Um, the purpose of which is to catalyze technical assistance for loss and damage. In terms of finalizing the Paris rule book, uh, I mean, I think, of course, it would be great if a deal could be reached, uh, but it can't come at any cost. We need to make sure that environmental integrity is maintained. So those are a few of the kind of the main issues. Uh, there is a lot on the table. There is a lot at stake. And, you know, quite frankly, it won't be easy. I think, you know, one major challenge is just to achieve the uh, ambition we need on mitigation, um, even if, uh, as I mentioned, we're still waiting uh, NDCs from a few large countries, um, but even if these are on the more ambitious side, it will be difficult to close the gap to 1.5 uh, 1 degrees. And should we reach COP26 without sufficient ambition or mitigation, it will be important to kind of set out a path or a vision for how to close that gap in the next few years. Uh, the pandemic, of, po of course, poses another enormous challenge. Um, in large parts of the world, vaccination rates are still incredibly low. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to prioritize, let alone afford uh, climate adaptation and mitigation when you're struggling and having to deal with a massive health catastrophe when people are dying and when your economy is in 
well, I can't even find the words, like destroyed. Um, so, and also this kind of, this, this inequity we're seeing in global vaccine access, of course, it also um, undermines kind of global trust, uh, well, trust between countries. And uh, that can also spill into the, the climate talks. And I'm sure it would impact the negotiations in the CBD process uh, as well. So uh, we need to ramp up um, kind of this push to vaccinate the world. Uh, again, what the G7 delivered the other week was not enough. And in addition to that, um, I mentioned the 100 billion in climate finance, that's really crucial to deliver. But I and many others think that there needs to be a broader push on this front. Uh, it's really um, positive with the SDRs discussion. That seems to be pretty much a done deal now. But what we need to see is that the richer countries um, kind of choose to give up some of their shares uh, or the proportion of SDRs in favor of uh, developing countries. And it would also be good, as I think Sam mentioned, if we could do more about uh, debt relief to make sure that we all get out of this um, crisis. Of course, the pandemic also has very practical implications for COP26. I mean, how to host uh, a safe and inclusive in-person event in just a few months time. It's very positive and, you know, frankly, quite high time <laughs> that the UK has announced that it will, uh, you know, vaccinate or help provide vaccines to delegations uh, that wouldn't have access to these otherwise. But still, I mean, logistic hurdles will um, remain and uh, a lot of the work also needs to take place before COP26. And uh, as you know, we've just come out of these subsidiary body sessions and a lot of delegations, um, you know, they're pointing to, to difficulties and uh, with conducting these talks online and there are lots of question marks around kind of the status of the documents coming out of those meetings. But Anthony, uh, to finish off, you also asked me to uh, point to a few kind of sources of optimism or opportunities. And I think I'd mentioned three which are related to climate action more broadly. The first is that climate change has really soared up on the political uh, agenda in the last few years. I mean, everybody's talking about this now. Uh, and we're seeing, as Sam mentioned, a lot of countries making um, pledges. And of course, it's massively important that we have a new president in the White House. Uh, the second is that the economics of acting on climate change have really improved. Uh, the cost of renewable energy has fallen dramatically. And we're increasingly seeing, I mean, at least in some countries, that it's seen very much as an issue of being economic competitive to, um, well, to kind of invest in climate action, to be at the, uh, to be at the frontier uh, of green uh, technologies, that it's seen as a way of being competitive, both in the economy of today, but especially in the economy of tomorrow. And of course, this type of, it's not good if competition results in adversarial politics, but fundamentally, I think that this kind of race to the top competition is, is, is a good thing, as long as it's also combined with cooperation when needed. Um, the final thing I'd point to is uh, that uh, there's so much public engagement around these issues now, and uh, this is a really critical thing, and I think it's fantastic seeing in all, not least these, the youth movements all over the world that are demanding action from governments and politicians to do more. So I think that's a big source of, uh, of hope as well. I think my time is up. I'll stop there. Thanks. Anna, thank you very much, and again, for summarising with the or coming with three positive outcomes, in particular the last one, because it, it leads me very on, very nicely onto the question that I was hoping to address to Fahana, in terms of, obviously, you have such a great uh, depth of knowledge in terms of the processes and, and the engagement of the different parties. So what role do you think that civil society uh, and NGOs can play in, in shaping this, of this in particular in relation to Glasgow, and therefore what do you think of the, the sort of opportunities uh, that we have in terms of the super year? Um, well, thank you, thank you, Rob, um, uh, Anthony, sorry, um, Sam and to, to Anna and to Chatham House um, for the very kind introduction as well. Um, I guess, you know, um, in terms of my own sort of career spanning this 30, 30 years of negotiations since 1991, um, I'm putting more of my time in social movements and spending slightly less of my time uh, on academic reports and 
research and seminars, which is not to say that our contribution isn't important, it's hugely important. But in essence, I feel that our, our um, uh, systems of governance, our democracies have been captured by power, uh, by vested interests, and they have been hugely resistant to the insider conversations. They've been hugely resistant to change. They have uh, um, uh, used their enormous financial, economic, and political power to suppress, delay, deny, uh, and uh, you know ultimately thwart many of the ideas that would have made uh, reaching two degrees, let alone 1.5, achievable. And uh, so that is the reckoning, you know, we're seeing in terms of the Earth's tipping points um, and the legal reckoning that's coming now via the courts, including demands for, you know, new concepts like ecocide. Um, that demand is very much the result of a huge degree of frustration and our failure uh, collectively to have delivered the objectives of all of the Rio conventions, which I was actually part of the forest principles to a certain extent, the biodiversity convention. And I focused and specialized on um, the climate change one. And we had something called Agenda 21, which was supposed to be this bottom up transformational uh, work, um, which in fact left a huge layer of, uh, uh, of understanding at the local level and at the city's level, which was then lost uh, for, for many reasons. So, so I guess looking back at that history, I feel uh, more than ever, uh, we need to, at COP26 to bring the full weight of our understanding and our history and uh, our uh, now uh, a, a judgment on why things have delayed, been delayed and why we are at this point, uh, which is very, very grave in terms of the future of uh, most parts of the world, especially vulnerable ecosystems, especially vulnerable countries. And they are coming to Glasgow, if they come at all, with a very heavy heart and with a complete atmosphere of distrust um, and uh, a, a degree of scepticism about whether multilateralism works at the same time, knowing that this is one of the few fora, these meetings, the UN uh, meetings, especially the climate change meetings are where they have the opportunity to hold the powerful, the rich, the elites to account. Um, uh, you know, uh, on this emissions gap, um, Anna, um, so, so I think the unit gap report started in 2010. Um, it started just after Copenhagen, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, was the first time we had this reference to 1.5. So the 1.5 1, the 1 degree goal isn't some kind of surprise. It was the die in the ditch issue for the countries that I was working with, the Maldives, the small island states, Grenada on behalf of the small islands and 100 vulnerable countries said they did not want and would not agree to the two degree limit being enshrined in law without also a reference that it be reviewed. And it's taken 10 years to have that review and even longer for the world to accept it. So again, the good news is that it was referenced in the G7 summit and there is a much greater understanding and awareness that this half a degree is, is, is enormously important. But at the same time, we've had year after year of gap reports and in Paris itself, you know, I'm sort of gonna hold this up, you know, paragraph 17, you know, we put the then gap that was uh, evident, which we knew that there was a projected gap. Essentially, we had to go from 55 gigatons to 40 gigatons in Paris in 2015. And we put that into the, into the, the uh, accompanying decisions. And that was for the two degrees. Um, and for 1.5, the IPCC report, which came out in 2018 and subsequent carbon budgeting, said actually it's, it's near a 25 or you know, 25 gigatons. And we are miles away from that, despite the huge reductions in cost of renewables, despite the huge uh, gains that have been made in uh, our understanding of the role of buildings, transport, and decarbonizing all of those. And huge amounts of progress is, 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 is there, but it's not um, accelerating fast enough because we have this dead hand of political power and incumbency and huge lobbying efforts. And that's why I did glue myself to the headquarters of Shell. And I frankly feel that made much more of a difference than me writing another report about that. And I think that that's what the new social movements, whether it's the school strikers, whether it's the Green New Deal ideas, whether it's Extinction Rebellion, whether it's existing uh, you know, Greenpeace who just uh, 
did the undercover story of, you know, an Exxon, uh, uh, a senior figure from Exxon, you know, admitting freely that, you know, they know that they know no one's going to adopt carbon pricing. You know, I don't know how many reports Chatham House, let alone my colleagues worldwide have written on carbon pricing, but they know that carbon pricing won't happen. So they happily go along with that in order to provide a bit of greenwashing. And I think that this, um, uh, this veneer of action, this uh, co-opting of language, this deliberate acceptance of tools that are either undermined or they know are, are, are you know, going to be not, not taken forward is, is one of the reasons why COP26 is in danger, frankly. Um, and we have to adjust now the Paris pathway. We cannot stick to the timelines that the Paris Agreement had, which was to have this uh, global stock take and the ratchet and then a further round of enhancements in 2025. So this five-year cycle, which was at the heart of, uh, you know, ratcheting, progressive ratcheting down is way off track. And I would love to, to, you know, I'm very proud of Paris and the role that we all played in getting some of the most progressive ideas in there, but it's not working. And we need to put uh, faith back in the system and have an earlier, much earlier than 2025, uh, uh, enhancement of uh, ambition, whether it's through the formalized NDCs or another platform or set of mechanisms. So that would be an essential part of restoring the integrity of the Paris package alongside, you know, the rule book, alongside making sure that the, the markets, to the extent that they are going to go ahead, actually deliver real action, do not outsource uh, responsibility, liabilities, and push them onto countries that are very vulnerable, uh, once again, um, that adaptation financing is included in these carbon markets, and fundamentally that they have integrity, you know, and I'm much more interested um, in, uh, in carbon insetting, not carbon offsetting, you know, so how can your own project sequester and be carbon positive rather than you know pay someone else to go and do it for you so i think these sorts of demands in us are really critical anna's already talked about the 100 billion being an absolutely critical sum and there's no real reason for you know the rich countries to now wait to pat to, to, till, till glasgow to deliver that that was a trust building you know exercise to deliver that and the amount of funding that is going to um mitigation is 80% of climate finance goes to mitigation, only roughly 20% goes to adaptation. And again, in Copenhagen, the balance between adaptation and mitigation, this is 2009, was made. And so we're so far off track because only 20% roughly of that, uh, um, uh, the existing climate finance is going to adaptation. And of that, only 2% goes to small islands and 14% goes to LDCs. So the very vulnerable countries that are about 80, 90 countries are getting peanuts. And so they are losing faith, they are losing hope, they're feeling massively uh, 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 disenchanted as to why accessibility is, is uh, not a bigger issue and, and, uh, and doesn't get more time. And I think, the, finally, I, I think I've got a, a minute or so. so. So the big question really is how we deal with our own denial about what the decade of delay, uh, two decades of delay has been. Um, so we had a decade of delay when we had Kyoto, is it gonna happen, isn't it gonna happen, is it a second commitment period? We've had another decade of delay where we didn't make good on any of those gap reports. You know, we acknowledged them. I was there, I was drafting every year, year out, year out another COP decision, you know, responding to a bigger gap, you know, which was all supposed to be plugged by 2020 and that hasn't happened. So we hit 2020 and it was only because of COVID that we had, you know, the, the downturn, which is now all being uh, eroded as economies recover and go back to um, uh, worse versions of themselves in some ways in some countries, you know, uh, in building in fossil fuel infrastructure. And that's why there is this demand and absolutely won't go away uh, for loss and damage. And loss and damage, again, in the Paris uh, Agreement, my, my mandate as a lawyer and as a strategist and advisor was to negotiate a separate article with the big picture headline words, loss and damage, so that there's denial of what the consequences now are of this delay on what the consequences are of not paying enough attention to resilience and adaptation in the last 20 years, what that is, and that is residual resulting loss and damage. And this is decimating 
you know, many vulnerable countries, displacement, droughts, floods, hurricanes, you know, the statistics and the figures are really awful. And on top of that, as Anna has said, you know, the words to describe what is happening in real life to the economies of these countries, um, you know, small islands, the Maldives, you know, 80% um, of their income comes from tourism, which is now off, off the table, that vanished overnight. It's not coming back uh, in, any, in any shape or form. And so uh, debt relief, uh, a fundamental restructuring of the global uh, economy so that it truly protects uh, the vulnerable, uh, a global delivery of, um, of, of, uh, of, of uh, um, uh, biodiversity, um, uh, an, an end to biodiversity losses of, of stopping, you know, nature being killed. You know, there's no point having nature-based solution, solutions if actually all that's happening, including in this country, as we've just seen um, the UK report, you know, our, bi our biodiversity has been decimated over the last 30 years and we're nowhere on track to that. So I think these are the fundamental reality checks that COP26 has to grapple with and it has to come up with a clearer and more honest uh, storyline and an end result than just saying, oh, we've delivered these updated NDCs and, uh, oh, sorry, they don't add up, but let's all come back in 2025 and put in, you know, 10-year NDCs that kick the story down um, much later down the, the, the line again. So um, uh, I am optimistic, though, that the economy and the world is moving much faster um, and people, especially our young people all over the world, are holding politicians to account and they're using um, innovative uh, techniques, whether it's litigation, whether it's direct action, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, setting up new commissioners for the future. There's all sorts of new things that are happening that are making sure that uh, investors also change their tune very quickly. You know, you've had shareholder actions at Shell and Chevron and Exxon, which have resulted in uh, more climate friendly boards being uh, installed. So the, the jury is out as to whether we can um, turn things around quickly, but uh, we, we still have a long way to go and COP26 must, uh, you know, lay its, uh, lay its uh, you know, provide a roadmap for all of those things. So thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Fahada. Uh, real food for thought. Um, I'm glad you finished on an optimistic note because much of what you were saying, I think was, cutting and to the bone and a bit depressing, but as you said, you finished up on the optimistic note. Um, could I pick up on one of the points that I think runs through the theme of all three presentations? Bahana, in particular, you talked about the sort of the NDC cycle being too slow uh, and yeah, 2.5 year reporting, maybe the five year reporting. Uh, and both Anna and Sam mentioned the NDC increases that we've seen in recent months. So it, it's sort of a bit of a question is, we've seen some countries increasing their NDCs, uh, UK, EU, US putting one in, all of this is, is positive. Do we think that it's likely that countries, uh, people point towards China, for example, which has said peaking before 2030, are we gonna see countries going a bit further before Glasgow? Are we optimistic that that's possible? And then the follow-up question in terms of what Fahana was raising, do we think a, uh, others on the panel think that a, a more frequent cycle of reporting, A, will be politically acceptable, and B, will have the desired results? So Sam, maybe to you first in terms of the China question, is, is a revised NDC or increased offer from China thought about possible, thought about possible, et cetera? And sorry, before you answer, other people, please do put your Q&As uh, in the, in, in, in at the bottom of the screen. We've got a couple at the moment, but otherwise I'm gonna keep firing questions and they're probably not the most interesting. I think our audience will have much more interesting questions than me. So Sam, over to you. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll say a few things about, I think how we should think through where the ambition might come from in, in, in China. Um, just to you know, quickly sort of put, it, put, put the conversation in context and to refer back to a couple of the things that were that, that were mentioned, I mean, I think what made the Paris Agreement possible to a large extent was, well, it was really to, 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 um, in terms of the big kind of structural movements that, that, that needed to happen, in my opinion, for, for it to be possible. One diplomatically was the um, then unprecedented agreement between the US and China, uh, between Barack Obama and Xi Jinping, that kind of um, 
uh, created the and, and changed many of the dynamics between at that time the G77 and um, uh, and the the sort of global north in terms of uh, the way that the ambition could be framed and the way that the, the Paris could be made possible. The other actually was was a massive shift in the real economy, particularly the falling price of, of renewable energy, which again has a lot to do with the scale of production in China and learning curve effects uh, and so on that were unleashed by uh, by, by China's own prioritization of uh, of of um, uh, climate friendly technologies as uh, as strategic emerging industries and kind of position themselves to be leading suppliers of those um, to the rest of the world. In the subsequent years, of course, Trump, you know, blew that relationship out of the water and indeed, um, you know, uh, reduced the, the, the US's uh, uh, the, the sort of uh, modicum of trust that, that the US had, had managed to sort of build in, in the intervening periods. But China kind of stayed the course on, on Paris. And what that indicates, I think, and, and still is true, is that really China's participation is, uh, is fundamentally uh, about nationally, national self-interest. There is an understanding that you know, participating in, in, this, uh, in this process is important for China in terms of its own positioning as a leading supplier of, of clean technologies, as um, as a, as itself a, a you know a country that's that's very vulnerable to to the effects of climate change, um, and that wants to see an economic transition that includes kind of moving towards uh, towards innovation away from polluting industries, dealing with air pollution, dealing with issues of public legitimacy around uh, around kind of pollution uh, pollution that's a, you know major sort of issue of concern. So I do think there's there's strong domestic pressure and tr strong domestic domestic interest for higher climate ambition in China. What's unfortunate is the, the um, it's not going far enough. There is there's a strong support for green industry, but there's not yet enough curbing of of the you know brown as it were of the um, of particularly of coal, and uh, and the current fourteenth five year plan doesn't see the the requisite level of ambition, uh, partly because it's uh, it's. Uh, and, and this is explicitly really in the text, seeing a need for hedging with energy security in a context of growing geopolitical tension. And this sort of leads me to, to the final, I hope this doesn't sound like a cop-out answer, which is to say this, you know, China's, um, uh, any pledge made by China this year is still part of, of, of a kind of a series of moving parts diplomatically um, that I think we still need to, to watch very carefully. And a big part of that is still the solidarity piece with uh, that, that the rich countries need to offer. You know, this there's not only you know it's not only morally incumbent on rich countries to because of their historic responsibility and because of uh, because of uh, you know many of the other inequalities that we can point to that are you know so richly symbolised by the, by the vaccine inequality, it's not only morally incumbent on rich countries to to offer something, but actually strategically there's really no way to to kind of move this um, unless uh, rich countries kind of can can go first and and start a a competitive dynamic of a sort of race to the top, particularly on the solidarity offer. I really think that's that's important. Otherwise, you know, to put it sort of very frankly, China can fall into a very traditional position as the kind of leader of the of the G77 uh, sort of countries and not be pushed uh, to, to, to be more ambitious. And I think, um, you know, that, that there isn't really any other way through it. Um, so that's my slightly long winded answer. Thanks. Um, before handing over to Anna, could I just ask, in where do you think the China hosting the CBD fits into the, or does it fit at all into their outlook and, and sort of ambition in relation to COP uh, twenty six? In in theory, that there's you know that there's a really um, interesting interplay that 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 you could create, and it was something that was talked about a lot in sort of high level bilateral meetings and so on between the UK and China, uh, it, it, you know, in the uh, particularly in twenty nineteen, and early twenty twenty. Um, and you know, China clearly saw hosting, or maybe still sees hosting the CBD COP15 as a sort of soft power um, uh, gift. Really, you know, it's got eco civilization, Xi Jinping's kind of signature leadership brand in the title of a big UN conference. Um, they are interested in exporting this concept of ecological red lines, which is a part of China's national conservation policy, and want to link that to the 30 by 30 targets and so on. So there's there's kind of an area here that you could find some leadership coming from China, and, and theoretically there is. Um, China's also co-host of the, of the, the nature-based solutions track under the, under the UNFCCC. But there's really not enough momentum here, as, as I alluded to, you know, partly this is because they haven't been able to be, you know, physical negotiations. 
uh, Brazil were blocking the, the, the idea of, of, um, of there being online negotiations. For a while, there was a kind of impasse there, which China did manage to push through, and there have now been online negotiations. By most accounts, people are very unhappy with the quality of, of chairing as well by, by the secretariat and so on. The, 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 the texts are just not being updated fast enough. There's not really enough kind of work going on to, to get things in place. Um, and, and I don't really see much, uh, much momentum here. And what I haven't seen is, for example, really interesting proposals about how you could link those, those two processes in practice. You know, for example, you could have uh, a, an NDC from China that includes um, uh, elements of, of the offer to, to, the, to the biodiversity con uh, convention or some attempt to coordinate the NDCs with, the, with their equivalent under the biodiversity convention, the so-called NBSAPs. So you could you know, create kind of the, these more um, uh, aligned uh, iterative type, uh, types of, of proposals, but there's really none of that innovation happening at the moment. So I'm, I'm unfortunately relatively pessimistic about the, the chances of, of uh, the coming COP15 really um, uh, unlocking anything new. Thank you. Um, I'll come back to the others uh, if you've got any thoughts on the CVD comment, but Anna, to, to you in terms of this question about shorter reporting periods, are you have any optimism that other countries are going to come in with higher pledges? But also then maybe I could add a, a question that's coming on the chat that I think is linked to this. We have the 2030 targets, but then there's also the net zero and the question that yeah people are asking, it's very easy for companies and countries to pledge net zero 2050. Most people that not in my term of office is a is, is a great uh, the Nimtoff syndrome. Um, so is that something that yeah we started we should be more concerned about? Uh, and yeah, also if you have thoughts in terms of what offsetting might mean in terms of some of the BECs and other issues, is that of concern? But but maybe just yeah. NDC increases, is there a possibility, and how do we harden up, or will people harden up NDCs in any way? Thanks. Um, no, I, I mean, I think it's great when countries and companies commit to uh, achieving net zero uh, emissions, but as you say, it's quite easy to make these pledges far into the future, and we really need to act this decade, according to the IPC, we must, uh, we must reduce global emissions by 45% by 2030 to be on track for 1.5 degrees. So it's not enough to set these uh, mid-century targets. You also need to make sure that you have an NDC, um, which will get you there and get you on track, and um, that you put policies in place now um, that will put you on track to also achieve the NDC. And I think that's something that we shouldn't kind of forget in this super year because we're focused so much on pledges uh, and we're focused on delivering this global biodiversity framework. Um, but often there is a huge gap between what is being pledged and the kind of the policies that are defining uh, how we actually get there. I mean, the, the UK Climate Change Committee came out the other uh, day with a report which described this discrepancy be between the UK's targets and what it's actually uh, doing. And I think, yeah, as, as Farhan said, we need to, you know, we can't keep kicking the can down the road. Maybe it's, it would be a good idea to have shorter reporting periods especially for, well, I don't know exactly how to do this kind of logistically. It's also important to keep countries' capacity in mind, but most importantly, these pledges also need to be implemented. And there will come a certain point where, you know, the public sees through this, that governments are making pledges, but they're not kind of implementing them. So I think what would also be really good this year ahead of COP26 is if we have a big push for concrete policies to show that we are gonna get there. And that can be about, uh, you know, implementing bans on internal combustion engines by a certain date, phasing out not just coal, but also oil and gas production uh, and so on. So I guess that would be my response to that question. Yeah, Fana, please do come in on that. But I'm just, I, I'm gonna add other questions on, but otherwise we're not gonna get through them. So please answer those other ones. But also I think there's an excellent question. And I don't know if you are uh, reading the chat at the same time, but there's a, a question about creating a benchmark for uh, companies and countries is what would be on your benchmark for these are the absolutes that people have to 
or it has to be achieved for there to be a, a success in terms of competency. So, but, but do uh, answer the other questions in terms of net zero as well. well just, just, I guess, uh, take, taking up the thread immediately from Anna about the net zero goal. So, so the net zero goal in the Paris Agreement was intended to solve two problems. One that the treaty had no link with science, with climate science, and it had no end date. There was legally no end date and scientifically no link with climate science. So, so that's what the, you know, we didn't have in Kyoto, we didn't have in the convention. Countries could come forward. This is the richest countries, by the way, could come forward and propose increased emissions targets and call them targets. And so this ratcheting an end date and this cycle, including net zero was meant to be part of that. And the 2050 date aligned at that time with roughly a 50% chance at least and a 66% chance of keeping to two degrees and 1.5. So this is where the figure came from. It wasn't meant to be in a goal for an individual rich country to take uh, you know, as a, as a starting point, but, you know, equity, historical contributions, capacity, making good that gigantic gap, which has grown, you know, from the tardy implementation over the last 10 years in particular. Um, so that's why most of the vulnerable countries, most of civil society want the deadline, as I say, 2030 is the new 2050, as far as you're concerned, you know, and you should be, ha have, put in place every single policy for an absolute phase out of emissions from the fossil fuel sector and to have a balance in the uh, land use sector. So essentially those are our two big sectors uh, and they're not to offset one against the other at this, at this timeline. So I think what it has done and I you know, think the merit of the, the concept and individual countries, cities, companies using it is it exposes the good and the bad and the ugly those who have absolutely no interest in really changing their, their business practices, their business as usual trajectories, and are quite happy to, you know, to take this, the easiest or uh, least environmentally integral path uh, out by buying an offset or saying, actually, we're not even gonna count our emissions. You know, you have airports and oil companies that are saying, oh yeah, we're net zero, but we're not counting our actual polluting emissions. We're not responsible for our products in any way. So, so I, I think that um, it has a huge, uh, introduced a huge discipline, a huge amount of transparency and huge amount of uh, um, accountability into the system when there was none, both legal and uh, through, as I said, you know, uh, the demand for more, more detailed actions and plans and so forth. Um, and I think that that's where we're heading. We're heading towards that demand show us your plan, you know, for 2020, show us your plan for 2025, show us your plan for getting there, you know, why doesn't it address this, this and this. Um, I think on that question, uh, uh, is it Javier Pujos who's asked a couple of questions at the very beginning? Yes, a lot of groups um, uh, the, from the COP presidency in every country, you know, has its own list of what would success for them look like. Um, and frankly, for me, the UK's presidency's list must have nice picture of Boris Johnson with the world leaders and a few good headlines, you know, saying there's still room for optimism. Um, and actually the rest of the world is coming to COP, especially as I said, the hundred sort of vulnerable countries are at the very different success list because it wants, you know, real action against all of the benchmarks, all of the legal obligations, all of the uh, commitments that we've negotiated for the last 10 years. We want those ticked actually. And that's, um, you know, the big difference. I, I do want to say Anthony that, you know, the vulnerable countries are not sitting around, you know, waiting for a handout. That's not the case. In less than a week's time, the finance ministers from the vulnerable countries will be meeting and they're putting forward, you know, uh, a concept of a climate, recovery prosperity plans you know so these are action plans which are about uh, marrying and aligning uh, investment policies um, aligning nature protection policies and aligning the sdgs framework aligning climate all into one especially at this time when you know uh, in nearly every country in the world is able to and wants to uh, build back better as the phases so actually they're putting forward all sorts of things including 
ideas about insurance, including ideas about accelerated finance and so forth. And they're increasingly using their own funding and their own national uh, uh, funding to, to allocate to adaptation and loss and damage. So I just wanted to highlight that because it's not, you know, the, 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 the burden is already falling on them and they're having to meet it, whether they like it or not. They want to highlight that they would like more help and support and that was legally mandated. So the checklists for success are very different um, and globally, I think the, you know, Chatham House, I'm sure will be preparing a paper on this as will others. And I hope that we will have more global headway and come out of this COP, not with everything solved, no COP solves everything, but that we will be handing over to the COP in Africa with a clear pathway to bringing those emissions down with a clear pathway to not just the 100 billion, but an increased amount that is meant to flow and with a clear pathway for how we will get a ratcheting up now to the, to the levels necessary uh, ahead of the lock-in of low ambition, which otherwise looks uh, to, be, to be the default. Thank you very much. We've got sort of three minutes. Uh, Sam, do you have any thoughts in terms of yeah, the specific things on a checklist for either COP26 or the CBD that you haven't mentioned already? And there was just this other question, which I, I, maybe you can't answer in, in this time, but in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative versus the G7's Build That Better. How, yeah, any quick thoughts, really quick thoughts on either of those, that would be great. Yeah, so on the, on the, on the question about the BRI, um, the question was, you know, to what extent is this likely to become a stumbling block at COP26? And, you know, I do think it's one of the kind of diplomatic fault lines um, that, you know, is gonna continue to, um, uh, you know, is going to affect the kind of climate diplomacy. Um, it do that doesn't mean that there isn't a potential here for a kind of race to the top between, you know, a, a, a so-called green BRI and, and the B3W, the Build Back Better world. Um, you know, I do actually think that, you know, particularly when we're talking about, you know, how do you spur a, 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 a global economic recovery, particularly in the most climate vulnerable and poorest countries, um, you know, there's a serious conversation to be had about how you, you start that kind of sustainable initiative of, of, uh, of refinancing. And I think there are signs that China in particular is really uh, is taking quite seriously the, um, the, the concern around and, and the sort of uh, rising concern around, around um, its overseas uh, development finance and is looking to, to find those levers it can, of which there aren't that, that many really obvious ones, uh, to try to rein in some of their, their, their state banks and so on so that they um, uh, orient towards these more sustainable types of initiatives. So I, you know, I, I think it, it is gonna be, become a big uh, stumbling block, but uh, I think there are certain measures that, that they might actually take before COP26 that will help. Great, thank you, Anna. You have just a minute to answer. The, 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 yeah, again, this key question is, what's top of your list in terms of success or something you'd like to see happening in Glasgow? Um, I don't know if I have much to add to what I said uh, before earlier, but yeah, just to reiterate this point about uh, making sure that it's not just kind of richer Western countries that get out of this uh, pandemic, that, but that there is a concerted push both on vaccines and on on the economic front to make sure that uh, we all emerge from this um, as soon as possible and in a green way. And uh, that will be also, it's um, not just a climate and biodiversity of question, of course, but it will also kind of help on those fronts. Perfect, thank you. Fahana, do you have anything else that you just wanna reiterate? Um, you know what, I'm gonna answer slightly differently. I think the acknowledgement and uh, a, a, a way of tackling loss and damage is going to be the game changer at COP26. Um, because anything else is, is sort of fake. It's a fake kind of, you know, greenwash, let's massage the headlines type of victory. It's not really looking at what's happening on the ground. And I think a, a, a way of getting people on the ground, you know, those on the front line, those grassroots, other organizations that are really delivering and supporting people in real life and protecting ecosystems, that, that's what's really going to be seen as a success and is a success. Uh, so I, I know that I should be saying, let's get to the trillions and the billions, but actually I really think um, people on their own devices um, can achieve a lot. 
and they are they are able to look after themselves and nature very well and they they need acknowledgement and we need to essentially devolve responsibilities and support and enable um, and I see a massive you know my new mantra is community is the new cop where everything should be going via the community level uh, downwards rather than these rather top-down frameworks that we've done which are great and necessary so that would be my one one request and uh, hope that we do that great well uh, thank you all very much um, I've been on a number of events during London Climate Action Week and we have the smallest drop-off that we've had uh, of all so it's obviously stimulated people and they've stayed on the call so thank you all very much indeed for staying on thank you for your questions thank you very much for the panelists and let's hope uh, we come back in a year's time and we reflect on what success uh, the next year has been. So yeah, have a good rest of the day and um, yeah, be in touch. Bye-bye.